Hello, hello, funky people. How are you? Welcome to another episode of Funky Marketing Show. Uh, today, I want to start this episode a little bit different and read something to you. Then I'm going to present you my guest. and We're going to talk about different stuff, mainly content marketing and everything related to it. So um, let me read a couple of things for you. So nobody ever set eyes on a crusty old website and said, gee, this company is straight fire. Let me go grab my credit card. If selling was that easy, every Joe Schmo would be a millionaire, right? But Joe Schmo isn't on his yacht dripping in diamonds and popping bottles on Dom Perignon. He is obsessively refreshing his MailChimp dashboard and yelling, why is no one converting? Could it be the copy? Could it be the offer? Could it be the layout? Could it be aliens kidnap this, his audience? Today, my guest uh, is Erin. She's a one-stop shop. At least that's what she's becoming for content marketing strategy execution. She worked with more than 100 B2B companies. Some of them are HubSpot, Drift, G2, Metadata, uh, Predictive Index. Uh, and she helped launch a new market category to help secure 50 million Series A, increase block traffic by 583%, one content optimization engagement generated 550K in revenue, uh, shortened the sales cycle by 30%, generated 67 request demos and 150K in revenue. Uh, so lots of stuff. Uh, I wanted to read all of them. Uh, and now join me in welcoming Erin to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, welcome. And, you know, I usually don't present people that way. I don't like to read the numbers in this one, but you already have them uh, in your about section. And I figure out some of these things needs to be said. It's actually so funny to hear somebody read my about section out loud. That was fun. I've never had anyone do that before. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great story. And I like this kind of different... Uh, you know, different ways of people are actually showing their copywriting skills and everything. I had, I don't know, a couple of, uh, actually all of them were females. I don't know why. That had a great About Us section. Camille Trent was one of them. Uh, she makes lots of stuff, including MBA, uh, Damian Lillard and all kind of different stuff. Other uh, was uh, MJ Peters when she explained a couple of things that she has done. And, you know, when I said that people are like, he had no idea that it, it was like MJ. So the same with you. I like I like how you share the context and basically, you know, uh, invite people into the solution. Thank you. Uh, so first, I'd like to start with you know with what's going on with you because like following you on LinkedIn, I see that you are kind of starting the solopreneur's journey. And, you know, as I already mentioned, becoming one stop shop for content and different kind of stuff. Yeah, I'd love to share my journey with you. Uh, so I have been writing and editing professionally for 10 years and I had been working as a magazine editor, but like print magazines back 10 years ago. And I was on vacation and I sat next to this cute guy in an airplane and decided that I wanted to go move to Portugal to pursue this relationship. And now this guy's my husband, so it all worked out. Nice. But I had to quit my job to do that. So I had this you know, magazine editor job for a year and I'm like, hey, I'm just gonna freelance from Portugal. It's gonna be awesome, I'm gonna kill it. Guess what? I did not kill it if we're talking about financial results because you know, it's tough to make a good living as an editorial writer because you're pitching magazines. There's only so many magazines that are out there. So I ended up going back to full-time work and I've been working leading content teams for the last seven years. 
and freelancing on the side, on and off. So every now and again, I would take some clients, I would take a break. And you know, the last year and a half, I've been really on and trying to build up my business. So now it's, it's humming right along and tomorrow's my last day at my full-time job, which is the Predictive Index. I've been there three and a half wonderful years and it's very sad and bittersweet to leave, but I'm, I'm excited for my next, my next adventure. Sounds good. How did it happen that you choose to go on your own journey? Like, was it the, the course that you launched and, you know, seeing the results and seeing what's coming out of it or something else? Uh, you know, I've always kind of been entrepreneurial minded. I've always, you know, had an interest in working for myself and just the timing was right. I was getting so much inbound interest uh, from posting on LinkedIn, from going on all different podcasts, from making a lot of friendships with people and getting a lot of referrals from my peers as well as my former clients. So the timing's just right. I kind of couldn't say no to the opportunity. Yeah, I agree. That's the right thing to do. <laughs> so so tell me, uh, we're going to talk about content, but uh, how should we define content in 2022? I think lots of stuff are going on. People are using content in lots of different ways. Some some of them are becoming being really crazy with with meta and all those other stuff. So how do you see it? I mean, stories, I see it as stories. And these stories can be told any channel across verticals. You know, when I think of content, I create content in partnership with the entire business, depending on you know what the business strategy is for the year. So if one of our primary strategic objectives is to you know recruit top talent, then some of my content budget and my resources are going to be specifically dedicated to that goal. So it's not going to be just blogs speaking to our personas, but it's going to be different ways that we can use our resources on the content team to capture and attract and convert top talent to come work for the company. So it's not just that, you know, it's kind of a fundamental fundamental mind shift away from, we need to create a blog and a lead magnet and get people to become customers and then our job is done. It's a much more holistic customer, partner, employee life cycle mindset. So you're working as a partner um, to help the entire business needs. And that might mean, you know, ahead of a annual kickoff, maybe you're helping to create decks for the presentation because you want to make sure that you have the strategic narrative. And yeah, it's great if you put it on the website and you tell it to the, the world, but if your internal employees don't understand it and your sales team isn't able to have conversations about it, then what good is it to put it out there? So I think it's it's more of a holistic mindset and telling those good stories in all different formats. Yeah, that's very well, very well said. Because, you know, I'm still seeing today that company only look at it from one side or one perspective, or, you know, or it's just SEO. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to specifically the content, those kind of stuff, we're going to write just for the sake of, you know, getting traction from, from, from Google, you know, those kind of stuff. A and then they're targeting the decision makers, the C-level executives, and then the content is completely wrong. So, cause they didn't figure out who are they talking to and why they should do specific things. So we, we start from who we are talking to and what we want to do. Right. Right. Yeah, a lot of times in groups that I belong to, I hear people asking questions about content strategy. Hey, what's your content strategy for the next year? And I, I would say that maybe eight out of 10 people say, oh, we're going after keywords on the blog. And I'm like, well, that's in, you know, that's a part of an SEO strategy. That's not even an SEO strategy. That's a component of an SEO strategy. That's not a content strategy. Content strategy is not just, you know, the format or, you know, one channel. It's about the holistic you know, the strategic creation, measurement and distribution of content. Um, so I say I would say that I see that a lot, too. And it's just it's not their fault. I think that they just haven't yet discovered all that there is that can be accomplished through content. Yeah, I, I agree, too. Like, um, you know, distribution is also a part of it. Uh, you know, who are you creating the content with and why is also part of it. So basically it comes down to, you know, do you know what your 
core business is, why it is, what's your story, what's the founder story inside of it. So the whole holistic, holistic approach. But um, storytelling is uh, somehow getting into being, you know, the buzzwords and everybody saying it. You know, we are doing the storytelling, we are telling the story. But how do you see the way the company can differentiate themselves by telling their own story, not copying someone else, not looking at what competitors are doing, you know, just coming from the core of the company, because that's how I see the story. Okay, there is some bigger change that we need to, uh, you know, to look up to, but then what's our part in that bigger change and how do we communicate that? Yeah, I think it starts with a lot of market research, right? So it's understanding who your competitors are and not just your competitors, but you know, what is a what's a market gap that you could fill? And that will kind of guide your company decision if you're going to, you know, compete within an existing category and differentiate yourself against the players or if you're going to create a new category. Um, and that's something that we did at the Predictive Index is we created a new category because the space that we were playing in was becoming quite saturated. And we knew that our platform and our whole solution was so much bigger than just the category that we were known for. So yeah, I think it's a matter of just really doing a lot of interviews, a lot of research, and then you know coming up with the best way to frame your solution. Mm, a question there. How did you come up with, a, with the fact that you need to create a new category? What are some indicators that were guiding you? Because I'm asking you because the company I've been working with called User Guiding, uh, you know, has found out that, you know, uh, from the interviews that sales is doing with the customers, from the interview that customer success is doing with the customers, they wanted to know how the customers are looking for them, how they are calling them. And then they found out that they're calling them with bunch of different names because basically it's an onboarding tool and uh, they figure out they can go rank create the content for lots of different uh, you know for lots of different categories hmm. that they, they don't need to go with just one they, they see that lots of people from different um, from different industries from different companies are looking for them in a different way that's such a great point and I know that I've you know, talked to and worked with companies who are trying to create this new category, but what they're finding is, okay, so great, there's no search volume around this. Nobody's talking about this thing. So how am I going to play in this category that no one knows about? And it's extremely hard. So what a lot of companies end up doing is that they play in a known category, but they position themselves as, you know, you know, much more than this thing. So we're this and a bag of chips, essentially. So finding ways to kind of tether yourself to this known category, but showing that you're differentiated. So you're so much more than the way that you know it, there's a new way to do this thing. And that's kind of a nice strategic narrative that pushes you in the right direction without having to go out and create a brand new category, which can be really, really difficult. Yeah, I think I, I had a chat with, uh, with Pablo Gonzalez, I think, about, you know, just directing the existing category into the new one. And that's also, you know, one way of looking at it. It's also like maybe a smarter way to do it, you know, not trying to build something out of nothing, but just using the way that's already there and just turning it into where it, you want it to go. Yeah, and I think a lot of companies that have tried to create a category have maybe gone through something very common, which is, you know, you say, hey, we're no longer going to identify as this thing that we've identified for with for the past five or 10 years. Now we're going to identify as thing B. So we're not going to ever talk about thing A. It's a bad word. It's a swear word. And then you realize, oh crap, like that was how we made most of our money. So maybe we do still have some room to still identify as thing A while slowly talking more and more and more about thing B. So it's, it's definitely a delicate balancing act. It's not it's not something that any one marketer can drive or own or figure out. It's definitely something that needs to be done at the executive level. And then, you know, content plays a role. And once the executives and product marketing are making this strategic business decision, content can help to finesse the messaging and help tell that story in a really clear way. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. And I mean, you know, Basically, when you create any strategy, you go from, you know, 
what people know about you, what you know to do, and what's your expertise, right? You don't just imagine things and start talking about them. That's the wrong way to go. And, and that's why you need to, you know, still hold on to things that you known for, but use them to kind of get into the new space. Yeah, and I see a lot of companies are not coming out of the gate on day one being like, we're this new category. A lot of times I'm seeing companies that exist and they've seen growth and now they want to, you know, really escalate that growth. So that's when they start to, to talk about, you know, category and changing uh, their category. Yeah, I mean, anyway, I think like creating a category is super hard and, you know, it's not something that I would advise to any company to, to go and talk about it and like since i'm seeing more and more marketers talk about it especially with with christopher lockhead uh, and his podcast and everything like i'm just looking at it and thinking man you have no idea how it is to you know to to be successful in it and you know it might be the hardest thing you will ever try to do yeah for sure i mean i can think of i mean i can give you a very small example. Um, so boiling it down to me personally. So I'm going out on my own as a content creator. Something that's unique to me is that um, I'm a strategist and I do execution. So a lot of times you have a consultant or someone doing the strategy and then they pass it off to the writer to execute or the writer who you know gets the assignment and writes. So I do a bit of both. And so as I've launched into this business, I'm like, I'm a solopreneur. It's just me, I'm doing the strategy, I'm doing the work. And I've had to really stop and think about where am I gonna be in three years from now? Do I wanna be a solopreneur forever? And the reason I say this is because I spent three and a half years at an agency and I always said, oh, I never wanna work at an agency. I never wanna be an agency, but that's a fundamental like shift that I need to get over if I wanna eventually grow and scale my business beyond what one human can possibly do while still having some work-life balance. So I'm trying to think like about my own positioning. So I'm not, you know, necessarily going to be a entrepreneur forever, but I also don't want to be the traditional agency because I've been there, done that. I've hired and worked with 10 plus content marketing agencies while working with all these different clients. A lot of them aren't very good. So I don't necessarily want to be seen as one of those agencies where they hire really brand new green writers and the people are quitting every other month and you get used to somebody, you onboard them, the next person leaves. There's a lot of you know, problematic fundamental things that are inherent to the traditional agency model. So thinking forward into my journey in the future, I might, you know, differentiate myself within that category of content marketing agencies by being the anti-agency because I've hired all these agencies. I have edited work by hundreds and hundreds of writers. And you know what? I don't want to be like a lot of those agencies. There are great ones. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot that are very subpar. So that's an example of how, you know, me as a small business can differentiate. And without having to create some new category, I don't need to be making up some word for myself that no one's going to understand. People understand solopreneur. They understand agency. So how can I show that I'm quite neither, but yet I'm still one? You know what I mean? So that's like an example, yeah. like a concrete example. It's basically, I think I have this recorded, what you just said, saying it like two years ago when I started Funky Marketing, that was basically what I'm saying because I've been working in the agencies, I've been working with, uh, you know, in startups with the agencies and I was like, you know, let's bring marketing where it belongs, where there's, you know, uh, companies respecting the ethics in marketing, when some things are being done, you know, specifically personalized for the clients, not trying to do the same thing for every client, you know, basic mistakes that agencies are making. Uh, and you know, just going through the same conversation that you just uh, just mentioned. So, yeah, and uh, as as uh, you are doing it uh, the same or thinking about doing it, that's why I was always like funky marketing. It's not me. It's the community of people working together to achieve a certain thing. Yeah, that's so true. Because right now I'm doing business as my name, Aaron Balsa Content Marketing, and right now it is just me. But in a future state, you know, you're right, because it's not just about my work. Of course, I would always say that 
You know, if somebody I outsource work to or hire an employee and it's not up to my quality standards, you better believe I'm going to be up all night making that to the quality standards so that the client gets exactly what they would expect from hiring me. Um, but at the same time, it's not going to be always me doing every single bit of the work. For the next year, for sure, like I don't want to take that on in 2022. I want to just be responsible for myself for a year. But after that, you know, I do need to, to explore other ways of growing. Yeah. Same here. I think now is the, is the year where I'm gonna, you know, try to really get in, involve other people more. I mean, I've been involving them in a different ways, but I've been learning how to be an entrepreneur because I, I never been that before I started funky marketing. So that was the thing where I needed to learn more. Marketing was okay. That's what I'm good at. That's what I know to do. But entrepreneurship, it's completely new thing. Yeah, for sure. I actually had a business when I was in my 20s for a few years, and I didn't know really anything about the marketing side yet. So I learned this really cool in-demand skill, and I went out, and my friend and I co-owned this business. We had no employees. We did all the work and all the marketing, you know, and it was pretty cool. We made enough money to pay off all like my college loans and to, you know, buy a house and everything. So I did really well. And then I just kind of te like petered out because I didn't have the entrepreneur long term mindset. And that's important. I think that anyone could be an entrepreneur for short term. Like I'm going to build this business and I'm going to, you know, my goal is to make six figures. And then what? How do you sustain that growth? And back then in my early 20s, I didn't quite know. I didn't have a real good plan. You know, so I feel like now going into it all these years later with a decade of experience, it's going to be a whole different story because I do have more of a, a marketing mind and more of a long term vision. Love it. Love it. That's great. Uh, Amir asked a question. Uh, if there are small circles of people on LinkedIn who are leading the change with content. Okay. What's your answer to that? Leading the charge. Do you just mean the, the most the, known the change, the change. Creators? Okay. I um, think basically, basically the innovators is that's how, how I see it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I see a lot of people that are growing fast. I mean, a lot of people that I'm friends with, I would say that I've developed friendships with, which is nuts because we're also isolated in our houses and not able to go out. So I've really invested heavily in the last year, year and a half with making friendships on LinkedIn with my peers, yourself, Camille, who you mentioned, you know, Brooklyn, uh, there's just so many people, um, John Benini, there's so many people that I've made these friendships with online. And I would say that they're definitely leading the charge with content when I think about content marketing, because when I think about content marketing, their names pop right into my head. So I would say to me, that's what leading the charge is. And I always say, you know, the difference between content uh, writing or copywriting is I want you to buy now, or I want you to buy later. So content marketing, these are people, I might not need to hire you today, but if I, in three years from now, need a content marketer, these people are gonna pop in my head first. So to me, that's leading the charge. Yeah, I agree. And you know, there, there is this thing that we are seeing the same names on LinkedIn. It's about, uh, just wanted to tackle that a little bit. It's about who we are connecting with yeah. and how we are going from that. I, I, I took some time, removed like, 3000 followers, just, you know, uh, people that I never had interaction with, uh, not because I didn't lead the interaction. So, and just trying to connect with people who are not like into the B2B marketing space or not into the tech space, just wanted to, you know, widen my views and widen the, the circle of people that I'm connecting with. And, you know, suddenly I have lots of things, uh, people who are inspirational in my feed, talking with different people, and I have this new energy. Mm, that's so interesting. I'd actually love to hear more about, like, how, what was your decision? Like, why did you want to remove 3,000 people? And did you see, like, an immediate impact in terms of content metrics as well as your own kind of happiness? Yeah, it was, it was interesting because, uh, you know, Mm, I removed some connections, LinkedIn removed the followers and some additional ones. So I needed to, you know, to get them back uh, by connecting with, with new and fresh people. Uh, but what's interesting in that is that, you know, I started, I unfollowed lots of people as well. 
So uh, when I follow specific people that I want to follow, like my feed was looking very different. Hmm. And I was able to see, you know, the content from different people. And then, you know, when I connect with others, when I send them the message, we exchange a couple of, uh, you know, messages, then I'm seeing their content in the feed as well. So, you know, it just goes on and on and then you engage and then you create a relationship, basically. Uh, and I think LinkedIn is great uh, from that, that side of, uh, of, you know, of connecting with people. Yeah, I haven't actually actively unconnected with people. I don't want to say unfriend, unconnected with people or remove followers, but I have been getting more selective with accepting uh, connection requests and it's not to be mean. It's just because a friend of mine actually opened my eyes to, you know what, half these people are probably bots. Like, look at this profile. And I was like, oh my God, before I was just like blindly being like, yeah, sure. I'll accept that connection. And I'm like, am I accepting all of these bots? I don't want to be doing that. So now I'm actually looking at each connection request and trying to make sure that they're a real person. Um, you know, so I am trying to put some minimal effort of, of rigor into that, but I haven't been super um, thoughtful yet. However, I do like that they've added that new feature. It's like the little bell where you can turn on notifications for certain people. I don't have that feature yet. I know it's one of those slow rollouts, but me neither. Yeah, I think it's going to be good because right now there are a few creators where I bookmark on my browser and then I'll open their, you know, their profile and I will interact with their posts, but how much easier will it be to not have to open those bookmarks to have the notifications come automatically? I think it's going to be a really good feature. Yeah, there's also, um, I mean, I'm going to talk with all this with, with Daniel from uh, from LinkedIn, who is, uh, you know, uh, basically managing creators. He's going to join me on the podcast in a, in a week or two, something like that. Uh, but uh, one thing that, that you can do and... I have to thank Yag. I don't know if you know Yag from India, Yag, Yag Vanar Ganesh. Yes, yep. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I think it was a year, year and a half ago, he created this group on, uh, on LinkedIn inside the inbox. So it was like around 10 people. Now it's, I think, four of us. When basically we we were talking about different problems we are uh, coming up with different experiences, uh, you know, and basically as we are communicating inside the groups, we see the posts for those people. Hmm. The first thing we see when we come into the feed, and, and there were some really great people like Tara who was working uh, with Gravy. Yeah. I don't know, Nick Bennett was there, uh, Zineb Layachi, you know, Juliana Jackson, lots of people and uh, really good creators and people who are creating great content and who are right now, if you, if you check what they're doing, they're accelerating and going to the next level. So uh, I think that also might be might be the solution, you know, not just to get notified and engage in their posts, but also get, you know, pick their brains in a way. That's a good point. And once you do move it to the DMs and you actually start to build more friendships with people, right? So you can do that in comments too. Um, I think that some people move it to the DMs way too early and I'm like, whoa, slow down. I don't even know who you are, um, but I, I do want to make friends. That is why, you know, one of the reasons I'm on LinkedIn, but I say that it's kind of invasive to just kind of invade someone's inbox too early with an ask and not a give. I get a lot of that. I get a lot of people just DMing me. I don't know who they are. And I mean, just the other day, three days ago, someone DM me like all capital letters, like you need to tell me how to write better. I was like, Damn, that's so rude. Like who says that? You know? So I'd say, you know, slow your roll, <laughs> make friendships, but just like you would in real life, you wouldn't just knock on somebody's door and enter their house. Right. You would want to get to know them over time and then you you know you give as well maybe you go to their house and you bring over a bottle of wine or a cake you don't just go empty-handed so i think those rules that apply in real life apply to linkedin too yeah do, do you do you maybe have a certain time that you take before you you know say hi to somebody in the inbox i honestly don't do it very often at all um but I'd say I would definitely interact with at least two or three posts so that they know who you are. Um, you've interacted thoughtfully before I would, you know, message somebody. Cause you have to think a lot of people that do get a lot of interaction on their posts, they might be getting a hundred messages a day. So 
you know, it gets difficult. And they're probably nice people. I'm sure that they would like to be able to answer every message, but sometimes they get flooded, you know. Yeah. Uh, their time. There are a couple of things I can say here is like people are definitely not getting hundreds of messages. I think there are very small group of people maybe that are getting that. So don't worry about it. But for example, I can tell you what I'm doing. I'm giving them at least two, week, two to three weeks to kind of consume the content. I mean, already seeing them in the feed, so trying to engage. And when I reach out to them, I just say, hey, uh, just wanted to drop a line and say hi. Nothing else, because that's all I want to do. I want, just want to get to know them. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, everybody's responding to that. No matter if they think that you are a bot sending them messages, I, I usually write them myself. I don't use something to schedule messages. So I tell them right away, hey, it's me really here. You know, so it's it's not a bot. So they say, oh, that's nice. But, you know, but they respect it because you're not asking anything from them. You're just, you know, getting to them. And there's one more way which you can, you know, strategically go to, you know, reaching out people in the inbox. I'm not talking about outreach. I'm talking about different stuff. So like if you're using polls, for example, you have three blog posts on different topics, but related to the same thing. You can just add a poll with those three topics and people who are voting for specific, uh, you know, giving specific answers in the poll. You can just reach out to them. Hey, I saw that you voted for this thing. I have this article. Here you go. You know, just trying to give you value. Go ahead, read it. If it's valuable, tell me. That's it. You I know, that, that, that works that. very well. I love like giving people an out. Like when I have made, um, you know, sent an email to someone, I said, hey, I loved your blog. I just wanted to give you the compliment. No response needed. And yeah. that usually gets a response. If you're like, hey, I know you're busy. No response needed. Just wanted to give you this compliment. Um, that's worked really well. And that would work on me too, because so many people don't respect your time that if someone is respecting your time, then I'm definitely going to remember that person, you know? Yeah. And, and you know what? Uh, I think... You know, if you just now take two days and send a message to everybody that you didn't yet on LinkedIn, I think you will have clients until not 2020, but until the 2022, probably, you know, because because there are people that are not ever engaging, but are reading everything. And, you know, when you ask them who is like the person go to, to LinkedIn, they will say, Erin, you know, so uh, when you reach out to them and say anything, they give you a feedback on the content mm -hmm. and everything. Uh, basically, that was my experience. And that's how when I started Funky Marketing, you know, uh, I was active on LinkedIn, but I was part of the, the agency. Uh, so there, there were like 6,000 people in my connections at the time. So I sent a message to each one of them. You know, just telling them that I'm starting the company and, you know, these kind of things. And, you know, you immediately get into the conversations of all kind of nature. That's that's an impressive effort. 6,000 messages. Yeah, because uh, I tend to send message to each connections of mine. Sometimes I meet someone, but, you know, it's not, not on purpose. But yeah. then, you know, now we have this, I don't know if you're using Lead Delta. My friend Redren is, uh, is creating the social capital tool. Basically, it's uh, an advanced version of the LinkedIn inbox when you can mm -hmm. tag people, uh, sort them out by demographics, by, by some other stuff. And so you can actually, you know, uh, how do you say it? Basically, you can measure the way you are creating a relationship with someone. That's awesome. So like the steps. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm not using it, but I have heard uh, good things. For what? For uh, Lead Delta? Yes. Yeah. Nah, it's it's a good tool. Veteran is a good dude. Basically, uh, I can say that because, I mean, I was working with him, but also because uh, when he's talking to somebody that's using Lead Delta and they mention automatization or something like that, he stops the conversation. Mm -hmm. So he just wants to use it for the good purpose because yeah. the, the, the bigger goal is to use it, you know, create relationships with people here. And then maybe, you know, tomorrow, if there's no LinkedIn, you can take it to some other platform or mm -hmm. to email or somewhere else, basically. 
Which I guess is the goal because how many people do you know that's gotten kicked out of a platform, you know? So I know for me personally, I need to do that. I need to build an email list. I have not focused on that because I have been working full time and leading content teams and juggling clients and I have two small kids and I just have not made that a priority. But now that my full time job is coming off my plate, I am going to make it a priority to uh, start an email list so that, you know, God forbid anything ever happens. I hope LinkedIn would not do it to me because I do talk so many wonderful <laughs> things about LinkedIn all the time. But, you know, if that ever happens, it's good to have your, you know, your contacts all in one place. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been talking with Mike Vinette these days on, on Twitter and he was like, now Facebook is trying to ban me again. Like, man, you must be doing something wrong <laughs> with all these platforms. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It happens. I've seen it happen. So I think it even happened to Camille at one point, which is nuts because she posts yeah, nothing but helpful yeah. educational content. So if it can happen to her, it can happen to anyone. Yeah, I, I agree. So let's let's talk about uh, about the future, about actually 2022. It's it's like the future, so near future. And you had a post when you talked about you know three things that's going to happen uh, this year, and I very much agree with with all of them. Uh, so I'd like to go a little bit into that. So the first one is employee influencer, because uh, I like it because in I think 2015 when Facebook removed the pages from the feed, everybody started to panic. You know what's we gonna do now? And, and you know I was like just activate the employees because they will be the, the biggest influencers of the company. And now, like, we are slowly moving towards that, but it's still not that yet in the full strength. So so you think it's going to happen this year? I don't know that every industry is going to have employee influencers, but I think that more and more companies will start to see the importance and they will start to train, either train their existing employees who have shown interest, because you can't force anybody if they're not interested. Yeah or they'll start hiring people who are already doing this thing that they would like them to do. So I think that's just gonna trend up and not just this year, but in the future, we're gonna see more and more of it. When I think back to employee influencers and like the B2B SaaS space, the first one I knew was Dave Gerhart. I was working at a content marketing agency and I think back in like 2015 or 2016, he was making those walking selfie videos. And I remember yeah. thinking like, who is this guy? Really, he was a genius uh, way ahead of the rest of us, but you know, every year there seems to be a few more people and more and more and more in the B2B SaaS space. And I think it's just going to continue to grow. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think it's going to be a, a bit different, you know, because uh, we will have people like like you, like me, who are maybe not working inside the company and promoting the company, but also working with different companies, with different products and, you know, loving some of them and because they love it, they know they, they were do a good work, the product is good, started to promote them. That's so true. I mean, it works really well for the internal employees and for like if you're a marketing agency or a content marketing service provider and you're working with a client, why wouldn't they add on to part of your package some you know LinkedIn post from your personal page? Like, hey, guess what? I'm going to shout out this work that I'm doing with my client. And you're getting their name in front of you know tens of thousands of people why wouldn't they pay you an extra thousand dollars for that reach because that's probably better reach than they might get with just a a cold ad yeah totally totally agree and then we we go back to the leadership and the culture so this thing can actually work yeah exactly uh so you had some interesting things about the the way you see it like repurposing blogs as linkedin post articles uh, I'm kind of interested in that because I don't see LinkedIn articles anywhere. So just wanted to get, uh, you know, your thoughts around that. Yeah. So I think it's a matter of distribution, right? If you want to hit a wider audience, if my company, if I'm working at the predictive index, we target business leaders, HR leaders. Um, so, you know, we're distributing from the company page and all these other different channels and we have our paid ads going, blah, 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 all the basics. But now if I you know, have this audience of marketing leaders, our marketing leaders, they're a business leader, they can use our products. So wouldn't it be cool if I started repurposing some of this content and getting it in front of that audience? I've done it with social posts. Um, I have not done it as much with articles, but like Devin from Gong does it all the time. He does it really well. So any article from Gong Labs, he, you know, puts the first 
third or two thirds of it as a LinkedIn Pulse article and it automatically gets his whole uh, followers get a notification. And ideally they read it on LinkedIn, they click through to the Gong website to continue reading. And I think that's a great way for an employee who you know, has a long-term relationship with a company to, to have that kind of relationship. It's kind of tricky. You know, these days it feels like employees stay at a company for like a year and they move on and they move on. It might be kind of a risk to tie your company and your blog to that one influencer if they're going to move on in a year, you know, but if you, you think that this person might have some longevity, then it can make sense to, to explore that as an option. Yeah, totally, totally agree. I see it also with, with medium in a different way. But yes, you know, related to the to the SEO and this kind of stuff, uh, I don't know if people know, but, uh, you know, if you have the, the two articles with the same titles, uh, you know, on the medium and on the website, like the ones on the medium needs to be the same with the same title. So they rank, you know, the same because sometimes the medium can can go bigger than the website. Yeah. I can see that. I actually don't use Medium. I don't read it. I don't use it as a distribution channel, but I know some people that have and that have had success with it. Yeah, yeah. I think we we just republished the article with a link to the original one. That's that's all all we yeah. do because it's not duplicated content. So yeah, it, yeah, it and, works. You know, back in the day, you used to have to do like those no follow tags and all that stuff. But Google's smart now, so they know they can tell like which site is the original publisher of the content and. You know, so I think it's a matter of just having the right anchor text pointing to the original article and then you're good. You're not going to have the same kind of penalties that you might have had in the past. Exactly. Exactly. Agree. And the second thing you mentioned is uh, the research. So I'm also seeing that research is being done only by a few companies possibly the bigger ones. Some of the smaller ones, you know, got seen in the feed or somewhere else if they do it, but I see less and less companies do it. I've been, I've been seeing some of them during the past few years on Twitter, sharing this stuff and gathering to that, but I'm, somehow I, I don't see many companies do that. So Content Marketing Institute recently put out a report and they found, I think it was 26% of content marketers say that they publish original research which is still really low. There's a huge opportunity, but I would argue that that's, that number is probably skewed because these are content marketers that are active online and they're you know reading best practices. And let's just think of all the companies out there that might not even know that Content Marketing Institute exists to take this survey. So you got to take like any stat, any number, of course, I always take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. However, I think that you know research reports are so amazing. I love them. I'm obsessed with them. If you asked me, you know, four years ago, if I'd ever be obsessed with something called a research report, I would have said you're nuts because that sounds boring and I hate things that are boring. But you know what? I've seen the impact that they make on growth and revenue and lead gen and press opportunities and backlink opportunities and, you know, podcast appearances and webinar content and you can be using these reports for like a year plus and still be generating leads and revenue and opportunities. So I really do believe in them. And I think that they don't have to be boring. You can find ways to make them fun and interesting with good storytelling and graphics. You can use animations and graphics and make it a really pleasurable experience for people, both visually and with the actual copy on the page. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, one thing to add to that, you don't always need to do the research yourself. Sometimes you can use just one of the, the big researches over there and adapt it to your industry, to your customers, to your clients, and just show them the info that, you know, that is relevant for them. And it's basically just, you know, doing your own research, but depending on a different data and just using the right data to kind of show it. Yeah, I would never trust myself to do anything with data myself because I'm not a data scientist. I don't have my PhD, so I probably should not be messing with that stuff. So I, I do uh, about four reports a year or with the predictive index. My team and I have done about four reports a year. 
And we have internal data scientists who help us clean the raw data and put it in a format that's really easy for the writers to then go and create the story. Um, but we also do purchase an audience um, at times. We've used Qualtrics, we've used Dynata, we've used SurveyMonkey. Uh, sometimes we might build the survey ourselves, sometimes we outsource that. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can outsource some or all of the work because if you don't have you know, the team or the talent you need, that's okay. Like people can partner with you and really anybody could do this uh, research, original research. Yeah. Uh, I, I also want to emphasize that, you know, sometimes using the bigger research, you know, for your article to showing to, uh, to rely on those stuff can work really well because your customers maybe know that company, they don't know you. So they will read it because, you know, you created the article and show the data based on somebody else's data that they trust. So that can also work. Are you talking more about like the reports that are put out by Forrester and Gartner in partnership yeah. with the company? Yeah. yeah, I think I agree that those can uh, convince some prospects that they might be more true or more authoritative. Um, so that's great. I would argue that the average consumer that's smart enough to know it's still a paid opportunity, right? So Forrester, Gartner, they're not writing a report just for your company for no reason. Neither is Qualtrics or Dynata. So I think as long as you're showing that you did use a reputable source for analyzing the data um, and finding the audience, that says a lot. Like there's no reason why Qualtrics or Dynata has a really great reputation. If you're using them, I would I would say that I would take it as just as valid as something that is done by, you know, one of the big firms because yeah, it's I mean, it, play either way. Exactly. And I mean, it doesn't have to be the official partnership, you know, you don't need to do it. It's, it's public already. So you can just link up to that and just, you know, go from there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I would do it completely on my own. Like, oh, yes, I made this report and I surveyed my, just my email list because they've already been influenced by me. So the, you know, the data is not super valid. And I crunched all these numbers myself, even though I don't know how to use, um, you know, pivot tables, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't quite um, lead to a lot of trust. And I think that reports, people do need to take them all with a grain of salt because they're being produced by companies. However, there are some that are definitely more valid than others just because they followed the right procedures for, you know, writing questions that don't introduce bias or, you know, having a big enough population size. I've seen some reports come out where they interviewed 50 people. I'm like, that's not even a statistically significant sample size. Exactly. So. Exactly. So uh, the third thing, big content. So uh, tell me first what you mean by big content, and then let's discuss about it. I did not come up with the term. I read an article um, by Orbit Media, Andy Crestedina, and I said, yes, that's exactly what I love doing. So research reports fall into that category. It's any content that, you know, I'm not sure if you use any kind of prioritization model, but for content, I have like a Eisenhower two by two matrix. So I'm getting content requests from across the business. I'm going to be able to prioritize them based on high impact, low impact, high effort, low effort, right? So these are the content pieces that are high effort, but they're also very high impact. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to work them into your content strategy. That's what I think of when I think of big content. So research reports, like a physical book, um, you know, a big, huge event or an in-person event is even something that can be considered big content because think of all the content that you need to support the event and to promote the event. Mm -hmm. uh, big content, as an example, just in November, my team at the Predictive Index and I, we did a documentary and we uh, had a VIP event where we, you know, invited a select uh, amount of people and we screened this documentary and it was relevant to the audience and you know, we had like 99% of the people we invited show up and that was pretty awesome. Like, wow, they actually showed up and they stayed for like the entire, I think it was like a 25 minute event. You know, we made it really special. We sent them a box to their house. We sent them a movie poster and snacks nice. and we got them really like bought in and we didn't even make an ask. It was just like, we created this thing for you because we think you'd enjoy this and it's relevant to you. And that is kind of the essence of content marketing, right? It's being helpful, creating experience, and then leaving people with a favorable um, a view of you so that when the time is right, 
they'll think of you and then hopefully they'll they'll want to buy yeah i love that i love that thanks for sharing great example <sighs> so uh three things uh anything else that comes to your mind that might be you know might turn big this year oh i don't know i think that people are going to be less scared to be bold and be themselves i think that a lot of companies have censored themselves and that's why a lot of these websites sound so vanilla and of course you don't need to be offensive when i say bold i don't mean you have to have swears in your content and you don't have to be really pissing people off if you want to and that's your brand like cool but most companies that's not their brand but you still you can be bold and catch people's interests and not be so vanilla so i think that that's another thing people are going to be getting more confident they're going to be seeing their competitors win uh through differentiation and really strong narrative and really strong copywriting and i think that's going to be a trend too less boring content please god please yeah totally agree it reminds me of uh, i was going through the back and forth with with mike mike vinette and he was like i'm gonna name uh he's gonna just put description on twitter like uh i'm here to make your company less shit mm. <laughs> like because because <laughs> because this is what i really do and, and then and then like dan castle was also like he said when because his company is name offended right and, and when they're talking with companies they say you know but we don't like to uh you know to curse to use bad language this kind of stuff and he's saying you know like my company's name offended and i'm cursing a lot it doesn't mean that i do for that for you this is my brand your brand is something totally different and we're going to differentiate you by something else by being you not by being me so totally. that, that's also a thing that you know people need to understand what you're doing for yourself it's just what you do for yourself and for your company you know if you're giving up those services to somebody else i mean you do go deeper and see how they can be different not by being you yeah and i mean the best writers they can tailor voice and tone they can help you know define and document a brand voice because maybe a company's never had one or maybe you know it's been inconsistent depending on who's writing the copy so that's something that a great writer um could help with and i would say like for me personally i you know, have a pretty bold and edgy voice and I have a mix of clients. I have some clients who hire me specifically because they're like, I want my content to sound like that. Like, so they want my brand voice. Yeah. Then I have some clients who are really, uh, they're more, they're conversational, but they're much more um, professional and reserved. And that's fine. Like, I'm happy to also do that. So I'd say, don't be scared to hire someone just because you think they might not be able to write in your voice. I think. Uh, all writers can, they can adapt. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I feel I feel all that, that you're saying. Like today I was writing, working on strategic narrative with a company that exists for 29 years and ha has 16 people in, in employed. All of them, all 16 of them are engineers, oh, including wow. the one that's, that's managing the team. And that's something interesting, you, you know, like, how hard it is after 29 years to start working on a, on a narrative and what's the change? Why did you start? You know, there was a problem we solved, you know, basically yeah. back in the days, that's how it was even today. It's something like that. But then, you know, it's not that simple. If you just want to do the right marketing and communicate your stuff, it's a little bit different because like using them just to, to kind of get the point because they try to get you know, new engineers to hire them inside the company, but they couldn't because nobody knows who they are after 29 years, you know, and it becomes a problem. It's not that they just started thinking about it. It becomes the problem because they didn't communicate out things. They were, you know, talking with different, working with different clients like General Electric, like, I don't know, Samsung, those kind of stuff. But when I asked them, what do, other engineers say when you, you know, say those things, when they found out, they say, they don't trust us. Hmm. That, that is actually true, you know, because they don't see the proof of that happening anywhere. 
That's so interesting. It's, it's kind of ties back to what I originally said about content. You know, it's not always just for getting prospects into the funnel and closing them. It could be for recruiting talent. And I know that's a huge pain point for companies right now. So you know what? Use some of your content budget to come up with some website copy and some materials and a strategy for acquiring talent. Maybe you need to hire a copywriter to help with your job descriptions. There's so many different ways that good content can help all different parts of the business. I had a client last year that hired me to help them refine and document their mission and vision and their company values, because those are so important as your company is growing, you know, you want people to behave and exhibit these values that you believe in. And if they're doing this, these things, and they're very clear on what's expected and what's not expected or allowed, you're going to have better performance. You're going to attract people who, you know, those values really resonate with them. And, you know, the best values are sticky and, you know, I'm good at that. So I have got hired even to, to help with that. And that's another good use of content marketing resources. And you might not think so because you might think, oh, well, you know, if they're helping to write these, uh, rewrite our values, they're not writing a blog post. Who cares? You can repurpose a blog post that you published a year ago, update the publish date, give it a little tweak. And there you go. There's your blog post for the day. That time might be much more better spent in other pockets of the business. Love it. I'll leave this for the end. Uh, just tell the people when they can find more information about you, where they can reach out to you. Guys, I encourage you to, first of all, go to the beginning of the episode, listen to everything again, because we said lots of stuff we were going on and on. Uh, then go and find Erin where? LinkedIn. It's the only channel I really publish content consistently. Um, so it's Erin Balsa, B-A-L-S-A. And I'm the only Erin Balsa on LinkedIn. I'm very lucky. And if you Google me, you'll also find me everywhere else because I'm like the only Erin Balsa in the world, which is pretty cool. I don't know if that's true, but it seems like it. Yeah, like that. I recently found out there is one more Nemanja Zilkovic, <laughs> also working in business, living in Canada, and we basically have the beard and the glasses. And I was like, no, no way, that's not happening. I, I still didn't get the response from the guy, on Twitter, but we'll see. It's kind of something is suspicious over there. <laughs> but how fortunate is it to have a unique name? Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, look, I would like to be to be the only one with a name and the surname. So uh, I congratulate you on that. I'm not even the first, you know, when somebody types in Nemanja Zukovic, because I didn't build my website with my name and the surname uh, first. So. There's a football player, there's now a handball player, there's a, a photographer. So lots of people out there when it's sport, when it's those kind of things, you know, business people don't go up. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's something that people can learn from. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, if you're watching this, I can see a bunch of comments coming in. Definitely connect with me. Um, I will definitely look at you to make sure you're a real person, not a bot, but I will accept if you're not a bot. Yeah, yeah, it was Amir um, always, always supporting the podcast and everything. Uh, great guy, Erin. Thanks once again for uh, for being here with me for for an hour talking about different stuff related to the content. I'm sure that we'll find a way to to work together. If not, just you know, rejoining uh, here on the Funky Marketing Show or someone else and just jamming around content. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun to chat. Yeah, likewise. Guys, uh, keep it funky, as we always say at the end. Yeah, keep it funky, everybody. Mm -hmm.